Okay, welcome everybody. Good evening. <clears throat> I'm uh, pleased to welcome everybody to, come on in, we haven't started yet. Welcome everybody to this evening's installment of the Freyland Biomedical Research Institute of ETC, Maury Strauss Distinguished Public Lecture. Many of you have been to, to many of these and you know this uh, program is supported by Mr. Maury Strauss and we're always extremely grateful. He's been somebody on the very front end of recognizing and helping us to support <clears throat> communication of science and medicine with the public. So if you wouldn't mind joining me in appreciation to Maury for supporting this program. So before I have the honor of introducing tonight's speaker, I always like to put in a plug for the next program in the series. So our next speaker will be on February 15th, uh, Shelley McGuire, who's the director and professor and the Margaret Ritchie School of Family and Consumer Sciences at the University of Idaho. She's a member of the National Academy of Medicine, and she will speak on the human milk microbiome, a paradigm shift for infant health. So a little bit changed in subject from tonight, but nonetheless, something that I hope many of you will find uh, of interest, particularly those that uh, have infants around or have kids who have infants or were an infant yourself at one time, as it may be. Okay, so it is now my uh, pleasure to introduce this evening's lecture, Dr. Ziad Al-Ali. Uh, Dr. Al-Ali is Chief of Research and Developmental Service at the uh, VA, St. Louis Health System. Uh, he's also the director of their Clinical Epidemiology Center. Uh, he's also a scholar at the Institute for Public Health at Washington University School of Medicine. Uh, he's completed, he completed his MD degree at the American University in Beirut. Uh, he followed by a residency in internal medicine and a nephrology fellowship at St. Louis University, and then following research fellowship at Wash U, followed by joining the VA Health System in St. Louis. He obviously likes St. Louis, and he, he's been there a little while. Uh, he's a recipient of the VA's highest research honor, the Secretary Award for Research, as well as the Distinguished Service Award of the VA of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs and of the National Kidney Foundation. Over the last couple of years, his work on understanding and dealing with the challenges of long COVID have been recognized through a whole bunch of things. I'll name a couple. He was appointed to the White House Interagency Policy Committee on Long COVID. He's co-chairing the Biden-Harris Committee on Developing a Long COVID National Research Action Plan. Uh, he's advising the World Health Organization on the long-term effects of COVID-19. And he was also appointed uh, to the White House Cancer Moonshot, Moonshot Data and Innovation Task Force. So he's a busy guy. Um, just last week, for some of you may have seen it, he was invited uh, by the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions uh, Committee of the United States Senate to be an expert panelist on their consideration of the effects on long COVID. And he made, uh, I thought his testimony had a, a very strong impact. I would like to think so. Uh, as an academic, he has over 160 peer-reviewed publications. Many are in the very top medical journals. A large number of papers in Lancet, Journal of the American Medical Association, New England Journal of Medicine, as well on the scientific front as a number of papers in Nature Communications and Nature Medicine. So his academic impact as well as his societal impact are both great. He has eight articles that have each been cited between 5,000 and 10,000 times each in over 100,000 citations. For those of us in the business, those are impressive numbers, take my word for it. Uh, the increasing worldwide disease burden of obesity is an area that he's addressed in his other work. Uh, he's estimated mortality, incidence, years lived with disabilities, years of life loss and disability adjusted life years for a whole range of cancers in virtually every country in the world and study the global burden of disease and risk factors. Uh, I have to say, as I read several of his papers and I looked at the statistical power, when I saw studies that included 153,760 individuals and 5.6 million controls, <laughs> I said, wow, you gotta believe this guy when he tells you about the statistics and what they're saying. Uh, underpowered is not a term that comes to mind. Um, he had a Nature article uh, that was highlighted on high dimensional approach, identifying incident sequelae in the respiratory system, nervous system, neurocognitive disorders, mental health, metabolic disorders, cardiovascular disorders, GI disorders, malaise fatigue, musculoskeletal pain, and anemia as relate to COVID. And case any of us were thinking this is a very unidimensional and focused impact. Um, so I think his work, uh, both for the public and his scholarship, have uh, given a strong wake up call to recognize and address the health challenges of the pandemic and possible future pandemics. And lastly, I just want to say 
He's a real advocate for communicating science and medicine to the public and spends a lot of time on working on that, something I think those of us in science and medicine uh, admire and respect. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Alali. Thank, thank you very, very much for this warm introduction. Really, uh, thank you. Th thanks a lot. And uh, really, what an honor today to to give the public, uh, the distinguished public lecture, uh, the Maurice Strauss public lecture at Virginia Tech. It's, uh, you know, uh, the, the main appeal for it, uh, for me, is is that it is a public lecture. So it's really a delight to be here and, and talking to the public academician and also member of the lay public. So what I hope to talk to you about a little bit, our journey, you know, thinking and discovering what long COVID is and, and how this all started. So let me tell you a story. So in March, 2020, and if you recall, you know, March, 2020 was, was sort of the, really the beginning of the pandemic in the United States when we started sort of seeing people in, initially in the state of Washington and Seattle, and then subsequently on the East Coast in New York City, you know, springing up with cases of, of COVID-19. And then people started shutting down and there were lockdowns and, and all sorts of things. So what we saw, we saw a world in crisis. You know, my team and I started thinking, okay, what, what do we do here? How can we help? You know, we, we literally saw the house on fire. You know, the nation is in crisis. The world was in crisis. COVID cases everywhere. At the time, we did not know much about SARS-CoV-2. We didn't know what COVID is. And we didn't know sort of the long-term impact at all. But we resolved right there and then that we were going to pivot from whatever we were doing. You know, the house now is on fire. We were cooking whatever, but now we're going to pivot and try to help out in this crisis. And then the question came out, you know, came, came sort of a, from, from our team, how can we help? What, what is it that we do best to really help this nation in crisis? And the answer was really very clear that we, what we do is that, we identify questions that are really important to the public and we address them rigorously using scientific tools and communicate them to the larger public. And, and that's really, so we, we decided right there and then to, to, to do these things. And, and then, you know, that started us on a journey of thinking about COVID initially and trying to understand what COVID is. And I do remember vividly, the very early studies that we've done was comparing COVID versus flu. Because at the time, there was a lot of discussion at the national stage and also internationally, how does COVID, a new virus, compare to the flu, a virus that we've known for about 100 years or, or more? And then one thing led to another. And I do remember myself you know, sitting on the couch in May, in, I'm sorry, in April of 2020 and reading this up at piece by Fiona Lowenstein in New York Times. And she was basically saying, we need to talk about what corona, coronavirus recoveries look like. She's young, was previously healthy, got SARS-CoV-2 infection, and weeks later was left with lingering problems, lingering cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. At a time when everybody was telling Fiona and people like her that if you are young and healthy, you get SARS-CoV-2 infection, you bounce back, and you fully recover. This is an acute infection that should not leave you with any residual or lingering problems. But, you know, Fiona was telling, telling us otherwise. And this is really, you know, for, for those of you who, who are in the practice of medicine, we're used to seeing case reports, you know, in journals, right? This is the index case or the first case of what long COVID is. This is it. This is it. It's not in the, it's not a case report in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's not in JAMA. It's not in Nature or Nature of Medicine or Science or Science Translation of Medicine. It's really in the form of an op-ed piece by an amazing journalist, a patient and a patient advocate who reported to the world her experience. Kudos to the patients. And this is, this is really very, very important in the history of medicine. You know, people rallied around her and it was almost like a sort of a micro movement of a me too. People in New York City, when they read this up at peace, they said, oh, well, that's me too. I have the same experience. I was young and healthy. I did not have any medical problems before. I got COVID-19. And now weeks later, I'm still stuck with residual problems. So Fiona, you're not alone. You know, and, and, and these people did a really an amazing job by you know, coalescing around each other and starting to form groups. At the time, they were not really, we, we didn't even know that long COVID existed, but they started forming groups of people who have shared experiences of non-recovery 
from COVID-19. That's all in April and May of 2020. And then it really kudos to these people. It really amazing, amazing people, including Gina Asaf, you know, Hannah Wei, the amazing Hannah Davis, Lisa McCracko, and Akrami, who really coalesced around each other and then formed what we call now the Patient-Led Research Collaborative. They decided to study this. They were the first group in the world, the first group in the whole universe to really start thinking about long COVID and wanting to catalog it. So they you know, formed what we call now the Patient-Led Research Collaborative. And they did what they call, you know, their survey of 600 people in May of 2020, cataloging the range of effects that, that, that afflict their membership, their group, including weakness, fatigue, brain fog, muscle pain, joint pain, and a lot of other manifestations. And they started referring to this constellation of problems as long COVID and referring to themselves as long haulers. This is, again, really, really wonderful in the history of medicine. The name of the disease did not come from scientists. It was not the NIH, it was not the CDC, it was not the WHO, it was not any recognized body. It was literally these people, these amazing you know, heroes of the pandemic who, who told us in May of 2020 that they were suffering. There were about 600 people suffering from these problems, gave it a name and gave themselves the name of long haulers. So I remember really, you know, me and my team sort of reviewing this data and we said, okay, well, this is really great, but it's an uncontrolled experiment. You know, these, when you survey 600 people who are affected and you come up with these, with these symptoms, it's an uncontrolled experiment. So we need to think about it a little bit more systematically and then really do the controlled experiment. So we decided to do the controlled experiment. And then we asked the question, what is long COVID? Very, very simple at the beginning. Like, what is long COVID? What are, what are these people talking about? You know, these patients who are afflicted with this problem, they called it long COVID. What is it? What are they talking about? So we decided to do what we call like an unbiased approach, an unbiased and discovery-based approach to understanding more deeply what long COVID is. So we did that with data. Here in this paper is about 70,000 people with SARS-CoV-2 infection and millions of control people at the time who did not have SARS-CoV-2 infection. And we looked at everything. We looked at all organ systems trying to catalog the potential sequela that can happen after SARS-CoV-2 infection. What we found is that they were right. These people were right. You know, we, we found increased risk of mental health problems. We found increased risk of nervous system disorders, metabolic complications, gastrointestinal manifestations, skin disorders, coagulation problems, blood clotting problems. A lot of cardiovascular effects, including you know, heart problems, et cetera, et cetera, lung problems, kidney problems, musculoskeletal disease, and you know, what we categorize as general problems, including fatigue and malaise and anemia, et cetera, et cetera. So, so really at, we, we concluded from this work that following SARS-CoV-2 infection, some people develop problems or sequela in nearly every organ system. There was no organ system that, that we studied that we didn't find sequela in. in, in um, and then at the time we sort of said, okay, well, is this really truly unique to SARS-CoV-2 or could this be happening really after any viral infection? And we knew of seasonal influenza that we've known for at least a hundred years. This is a well-characterized respiratory viral illness. So we wanted to do the comparative analysis or a head-to-head -head evaluation between people who had SARS-CoV-2 infection, people who had COVID-19 versus people who had seasonal influenza. What we found, we found that the magnitude of risk of these problems is much higher in people with COVID-19 versus seasonal influenza. What we also found is that the breadth of organ dysfunction was much more extensive in COVID-19 versus seasonal influenza. So we, we, we at the time sort of concluded that it's a really a different kind of post-viral illness, that these patients are onto something, that are describing to us something that is, you know, is really sort of a, you know, that's, that SARS-CoV-2 is, is inducing, and it's really quite different from, from what you get, you know, in, in following the flu. Well, we also found that the risk was evident, was very clear, even among people who had mild disease, who are not hospitalized for it. And this is really important because this is the group that represents the majority of people on earth. Most people around the world, most people around the world will have COVID-19 and will have a mild COVID-19 that does not put them in the hospital. And in this group, the risk, was, the risk of post-acute sequela, what we call now long COVID, 
is quite evident. However, this also increases according to the severity of infection, meaning that you know, the, the people who were hospitalized have a higher risk and people who, were, who needed to be admitted to the ICU have the highest risk. And then we said, okay, well, you know, long COVID is really this, this sort of a you know, collection of things, you know, is, is you know, as, I, as I showed you, literally can affect nearly every organ system. So we wanted to understand, is it really more expressed in older adults and younger adults? Is it more in females? Is it more in males? Is it more in black individuals? Is it more in white individuals? So if you look at this heat map and say, oh my God, Ziad, you're showing us this heat map and it's all over the place you came to the right conclusion. This is all over the place. And if you, and this is, this is, this is, this is correct. You're right. And then if you, if you wanted to sort of capture all of this and, and describe the disease after seeing this, I want you to think about the word non-monolithic. Long COVID is not one thing. It's absolutely not one thing. It's a non-monolithic disease. Some sequela or some manifestations of long COVID are higher in older adults. Some manifestations of long COVID are actually higher or have a higher prevalence in younger adults. Similarly, you know, there are this sort of distribution across sex, race, and, and based on health status. So one word to think about when you look at this slide, non-monolithic. So long COVID is really not one thing, it's a lot of things, and it could be expressed differently according to age, race, sex, and baseline health status. So at that time, we started thinking, okay, well, this is a new disease, and we now know, at the time we knew, that it can affect nearly every organ system. And we wanted to sort of, a, you know, do a deeper dive, try to understand what's happening in the heart, what's happening in the, you know, cardiovascular system, in the, in the, in, in the metabolic system, so the new onset diabetes and high, or high cholesterol, you know, think about kidney disorders, uh, the nervous system, and gastrointestinal system. So we did a deeper dive into each one of those. So this is one of the you know, first papers uh, in, in, on the cardiovascular effects of COVID that, that came out of our lab, led by Yan Shea, the, the amazing, amazing postdoc in, in, in my lab. Um, you know, th this, he, he, in this paper, we did about 153, we, we, we uh, built a cohort, about 153,000 people with COVID-19. And then um, two, two controls, one a contemporary control, about 5 million people, and another historical control from an era that predated the pandemic of about 5 million people. And then we observed these people or we followed these people for about a year to, to evaluate the risk of, of heart problems. What we saw, we saw increased risk of a lot of problems. You know, there was increased risk of arrhythmias, meaning that abnormal heart rhythms, increased risk of heart attacks, increased risk of heart failure, increased risk of blood clotting. There was really quite a bit of a quite an array of disorders that can happen in the heart system in, in these individuals uh, up to a year after the initial infection. So remember, these people got, had a COVID-19 and, you know, we, weeks or months later, they were still, you know, coming back to the hospital with or, or to, to their physician with, with problems in these organ system. And then we looked also at, cardio, at uh, diabetes after COVID. And you may have heard actually that, that COVID is, is in a way diabetogenic, meaning that COVID raises your risk of developing diabetes. And this is also borne out in this, in this uh, paper also by Yan Shea in my lab uh, at the time he was an MPH, uh, you know, cataloging the increased risk of diabetes and use of antihypoglycemic medication in the year that follows the initial infection with SARS-CoV-2. And then Evan here uh, did work to characterize the effect on dyslipidemia. So very clearly what you could see, dyslipidemia is high cholesterol. Well, you could see here two things is that diabetes really disrupt the metabolic pathways in a way that would increase one's risk of developing diabetes and increase one's risk of developing high cholesterol. And, in, and you really should be thinking now, like we were starting, we were initially shocked, like if this is like, how, how could this really be true? For a, for a virus that has an R in its name, SAR, respiratory. It's a respiratory virus that induces really a, a lot of non-respiratory -resp complications that, that down the road, including major disturbances in the metabolic pathway in, in a way that would lead to increased risk of diabetes and, and high cholesterol. And then, you know, Charlie and my team sort of wanted to look at the kidney function in people who had SARS-CoV-2 infection. 
So what he did here, he assembled also a cohort about uh, you know 180,000 people with SARS-CoV-2 infection with COVID-19, followed them for a year compared to control. What we really saw, we saw a decline in kidney function in the year that follows the initial infection. And you should be asking me now, like, okay, decline, but by how much? It's about four milliliter per minute in that year. What does that really mean? What does that really mean? What is four milliliter per minute? That's equivalent to the kidney aging four years in the span of just one. So these people's kidneys aged four years in the span of one. So how can we? How do we think about these problems? We think about about it as almost like a form of accelerated aging. We think of the initial hit of SARS-CoV-2 in some people, obviously not everyone, in some people, sort of lead to a, 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 you know disturbances in kidney function and accelerated decline in kidney function that that um, that sort of a, you know almost simulates aggressive or or accelerated aging and and, and fast aging in these individuals. And at the time, we were like really getting a lot of questions from the public, and and a lot of questions from you know media, and 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 a lot of a lot of sort of stakeholders, you know, telling us that, you know, well, the pandemic left a lot of us sort of the pandemic itself was a traumatic event. You know, it was was you know a lot of people sort of uh, you know did not tolerate the first year of the pandemic very well, and and how did it affect the mental health of Americans, and whether or not the people who actually got SARS-CoV-2 had it worse. So we knew at the time that that we as a nation, you know, and, and the world, you know, went through the horrible pandemic. There was lockdowns, couldn't couldn't do what we needed to do, couldn't do, couldn't travel, couldn't see loved ones, couldn't even go to the gym. There was a really major disruption in our social and 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 and, and daily activities that, in some instances, could lead to 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 mental um, to, to 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 some distress. So we knew that we were a nation in distress at the time, but we wanted and asked the question. Do people with SARS-CoV-2 have it worse? And, and the answer is clearly yes. That 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 although we all of us, all of us endure some form of a duress or 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 distress in the in the um, you know early phase of the pandemic in 2020 and 2021, it is very, very clear that people who got SARS-CoV-2 infection actually displayed higher risk of depression, anxiety, PTSD, cognitive problems, what people refer to colloquially as brain fog and sleep disturbances. This is very, very clear in the data. And, and, and now we know that because, you know, most likely there is neuroinflammation and other things that are happening as a result of SARS-CoV-2 infection. Again, in some people, that doesn't happen in everyone, but in some people it manifests as brain fog and some people it manifests as, you know, some neuropsychiatric problems. And some people may, may manifest as sleep disturbances. Either they sleep too much or they cannot fall or insomnia. That they, they cannot sleep or they don't sleep very well. So Evan and my team decided to take a deeper look at the neurologic manifestation. And we decided right then, like, okay, we needed to, you know, that we're not neurologists, but we wanted to do a deeper dive to try to understand what's happening in the in the brain and the nervous system and then catalog all the sequela or all the health problems that can happen after SARS-CoV-2 infection in the brain or the central nervous system. And this is Evan's work. Uh, so and in, in, in really extraordinary work from Evan. This is really, I'm, I'm blessed to have a wonderful team around me, really, just really be beautiful and am amazing people. Um, so, so here Evan showed us that there is really increased risk of, of not only strokes, but really a, a lot of, uh, a lot of sort of a, 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 a sequela in the brain, you know, in, in including headaches, seizure, or broadly speaking, episodic disorders, extra, extra pyramidal, you know, problems, strokes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the really, if, if you if you look at this and say, oh my God, this is really just not one thing. It's not only headache, it's not only seizure, it's not only, you know, sort of what resembles Parkinson's disease or Parkinsonism. Um, it, it's really all of the above can happen in the post-acute phase of SARS-CoV-2 infection. Again, in some people, this is not everyone, this is in some people, you know, the, the SARS-CoV-2 infection can lead to to disturbances or problems in, in these manifestations, in, in these uh, uh, in, in these areas. So this is the last slide I will show about organ system and I will, will, will pivot to, to sort of some more, you know, forward looking um, ideas. Um, you know, Evan again here decided to look at the uh, gastrointestinal system and then, you know, uh, provided really a systematic characterization of all the stuff that can happen here. 
including a lot of sort of a, a, a sort of inflammatory disorders, motility disorders, and 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 and, and acid base disorders, and some liver problems. I think we talked you know previously about potentially some some liver problems happening in the post acute phase of or or following SARS CoV two infection. It's very very clearly here documented in the data that it actually happened. It's not it's not super rare. It's not very common, but but it certainly happened as well documented. So I hope I showed you so far that that in the you know, the long COVID can affect nearly every organ system. We worry a lot about cardiovascular disorders. We worry a lot about diabetes and cholesterol. We worry about kidney disease and neurologic and mental health disorders and also gastrointestinal disorders. And, and, uh, and, and wanted to sort of, uh, you know, then, you know, we were in 2022 at a phase when people started getting reinfections, right? So people, a lot of people had already had their first infection a lot of people were actually vaccinated and they started coming to the clinic with an air of invincibility around them saying, hey doc, I'm, I'm vaccinated and I was previously infected with SARS-CoV-2. So I have this double immunity. I have vaccine derived immunity and I have immunity from natural infection. I must be you know, super immune and, and uh, you know, it doesn't really matter. I, should, I don't want to wear a mask anymore. You know, if I get COVID, I'm, I'm immune to it. I'm, I'm shielded from its ill effects. And, and, and they had this air of invisibility around them. And so I started, started thinking to myself, is this really true? Like, does really reinfection carry consequences or is it totally inconsequential? Um, or if you want to phrase it, uh, if I had COVID once, you know, why should I care about reinfection? And, and, and the answer is, is uh, reinfection is not inconsequential. And this is really important because Reinfection now is the most common mode of COVID infection. Very few people are having their first ever infection of COVID. Very, very, very few people, you know, actually almost none in St. Louis, you know, uh, are having their first infection. Most everybody already had their first infection. Most people are on a second, third, fourth, fifth. So most people are actually in the territory of reinfection. So we asked the question, you know, does, and this is again, the work by Charlie, Char the amazing Charlie Bo and, 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 and my team, you know, ask the question, does reinfection really matter or does reinfection really um, uh, uh, is, is associated with additional consequence? And the answer is clearly yes. So if you, upon reinfection, people can still get, uh, people can still, you know, have, a, have mortality, hospitalization and, and sequela, both in the acute phase, Allah stated here in yellow, and in the post-acute phase, basically the long COVID phase, Allah stated here in blue. And the effect is cumulative. Meaning, what does that really mean? That means, that two infections are worse than one and three infections are worse than two. That's, that's really what the translation of that graph is, is that you know, two infections are worse than one and, and three infections are, are, are worse than, than two. And then we started sort of asking questions. This is again, the work of Charlie Bo and my team. You know, how long is long COVID? So we, we knew that, that, that the you know, patient community called it long COVID, but is it really, you know, how long, how long does it last? Is this a disease or a problem that lasts for a few months for a few, you know, years? Like how, how long does it, does it last? So we did a two year study here, you know, again, led by Charlie and my team, where we evaluated the risk trajectories of people with SARS-CoV-2 infection with COVID-19 over the ensuing two years after initial infection. What he found is that in people who are not hospitalized for the infection, the risk neutralizes, basically becomes normal. They, they don't have an elevated risk for about 66% of the sequela, 66% of the health conditions that we evaluated. And we evaluated about 80 in all organ systems, 80 health conditions in all organ systems. What he found is that you know, the, the, the risk abates, or basically there, there is no longer increased risks, risk for about two thirds of these, of these health problems. However, you know, the, the story was very, very different for people who really had severe COVID-19 that necessitated a hospitalization. So those patients, actually, the, 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 the risk horizon is more prolonged, and, and most of the sequela were actually displayed increased risk even at two years, meaning that, so what does that really mean? What does that really mean for, 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 for all of us here? Well, that really means that the people who had severe disease to start with they could still experience problems related to the infection even years out. I told the Washington Post that two years out, you may have you may have forgotten about COVID, but COVID may not have forgotten about you. What does that really mean? It actually means that it can still generate risk in your body and impact body systems, including the heart, the brain, even two years out. 
And now we know that this may be related to some viral persistence or you know, chronic inflammation as a result of the, 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 the initial infection. So it's again puzzling, like why would, why would um, the, the, the risk persist for so long in individuals who've been infected two years ago? Uh, again, you know, only in the severe group here and people who are hospitalized for the condition. And, and I think it's very, very important to remember like, you know, if you're two years past the initial infection, you actually may have forgotten you had COVID two years ago, but, but COVID may not have forgotten about you, especially if you had severe infection to start with. So how do we prevent COVID? And I think it's sort of a, you know, there is no, how do we prevent long COVID? I think it's very, very clear that there's really no long COVID without COVID, you know, sort of a, I told people at the Senate last week, last week that, you know, you, you didn't hear, I told actually Tim Kaine, like, have you heard of long COVID in 2019? You haven't, you know, it didn't exist before COVID. So, so there is no long COVID without COVID. And we now know that vaccines reduce the risk of long COVID. And that's really been substantiated by a lot of work from a lot of labs, including, including some work by us and, 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 and my lab. Um, and also we know that Paxlovid, this is a, this is a, the, the formal name for Paxlovid, what's commonly referred to as Paxlovid in the in in the in the um, in, 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 in the public sphere, uh, reduces the risk of long COVID. So Paxlovid also reduces the risk of long COVID. The other antiviral, Lagevrio, called also Monoperavir, can also reduce the risk of long COVID. So three things: vaccines reduce the risk of long COVID. Taking an antiviral in the acute phase of the infection whether Paxlovid or Lagevrio, Monopiravir, also reduces the risk of, of, of long COVID dramatically. Uh, well, I shouldn't say dramatically, it reduces the risk of long COVID, but by, by some. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not an immune shield. It's not a sort of a perfect shield, but, but, a, but, a, but a really it, it's, there's significant risk reduction. For those of you in the room now asking, okay, well, you told us all of this, and all of this really could could this could this be true? And could this be all mediated by a respiratory virus that has an R in its name, SARS-CoV-2? The R in SARS is for respiratory. Why would a respiratory virus? Why would a long virus? Well, a virus that's supposed to give you cough and fever and shortness of breath, and you know you're supposed to recover from it, you know, a few days after the acute illness. Why would it give you lasting symptoms that or lasting problems that in some individuals actually may last years? The, 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 full, the, the answer to this is that we don't completely fully understand why, but there are leading hypotheses. One of them is that of immune dysregulation or dysfunction, meaning that the immune system, after being infected with SARS-CoV-2, gets dysfunctional in some way that it subsequently lead to uh, chronic disease or to, to subsequent sequela. There is the idea of microbiome dysbiosis within us. You know, there is a lot of bacteria uh, living within us. Actually, the number of the bacteria li living within each one of us is actually higher than the number of human cells that, 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 that we have. And then there's this idea that, that or this hypothesis that's circulating around suggesting that, you know, the, the bacteria also get sick. When we get sick, the bacteria get sick and they may not fully recover. And their non-recovery is really what's responsible for disease. You know, there is also the idea of autoimmunity, meaning that Upon infection, there is some dysregulation in the immune system where the immune system started starting started to fight self. That's a, a harm directed towards self. We call that autoimmunity or immunity directed towards self, and 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 therefore sort of destruction of, of our own cells and our own you know blood lining, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Other hypotheses revolve around you know neurologic dysfunction and also inflammation of the blood vessels, of the, of the lining of the blood vessels. And that may explain why you know, the, the manifestations of long COVID could be diffused, could be you know, wide ranging in, in almost any organ system. So told you about prevention, you should be thinking now or tell me, like, okay, well, talk to us about treatment. How do we deal with this? How do we treat this thing? And the fact is that we have so far no treatment for long COVID, zero. Zero FDA FDA approved treatment for long COVID none zero that is that is not that's that is the, if you go to the full FDA list of approved medications for long COVID you get a number like this big zero none and that should change that really must change it's it's very very important that this really changes 
So when I when we talk, when I talk and other people talk about long COVID, it we really use it as an umbrella term. Again, if you if you you know when I when I when you think about long COVID, please don't think about just brain fog and fatigue. It's not one thing. Please associate it with the term umbrella or non-monolithic. It's a non-monolithic. It's an umbrella term for a lot of things. There's a quite quite a bit of overlap for those people who really work in the hospital with post hospitalization syndrome or post ICU syndrome. There is also quite a bit of overlap with other post-viral illnesses, including, you know, uh, uh, what happens after the flu. In, in, in after the flu pandemic, people called it encephalitis lethargica or sleepy sickness. Measles can also produce, you know, post-acute problems. We call it subacute sclerosing encephalitis. For those, for the lay audience, this is really these are all viruses that produce also long-term manifestations. So. COVID or SARS-CoV-2 is absolutely not unique. There are there is a virus called Epstein-Barr virus, mono or infectious mononucleosis, can also result in multiple sclerosis decades later. Decades later, you know, we, we also know of a post-Ebola syndrome, post-polio syndrome, and then we know of the condition called MECFS or, or chronic fatigue syndrome that resembles to a large degree. It's not identical. There is substantial overlap in the manifestations of MECFS and long COVID. MECFS is also thought to be triggered by a viral illness. So again, so long COVID is an umbrella term and it's really, it's, it's, it's unlikely that SARS-CoV-2 is unique. SARS-CoV-2 belongs to the family of a lot of vi viruses that produce long-term manifestations. The reason we woke up to this reality is that because literally we had billions of people, B and, and S, billions of people infected within a, a short period of time so it provided us literally with a magnifying glass to be able to characterize and understand what long COVID is. And this is, you know, sort of a, I think one of the you know, benefits of this pandemic is that it allowed us to understand that viruses or wake up to the reality that viruses produce chronic disease. And I think this is really a very important idea or a very important lesson that, that, that I, at least I learned from, from, from this pandemic. So, so what are the implications for health systems? The burden of long COVID is likely substantial. It, it's really not small. A single digit, it's, it's uh, you know, anywhere between 3 and 7%, but, the, you know, the, you know it, it translates to about 20 million Americans, and, and the number is likely to continue to rise due to the fact that not, you know, a lot of people are not recovering from long COVID, and there is an additional number of Americans who are having long COVID as a result of reinfection. And long COVID is a multifaceted disease that can affect nearly every organ system. We, we, we think, and there's actually data coming out from IHME, suggesting that a rise in the burden of chronic diseases as a result of, as a sort of, a, of, of, of these sequelae I told you about, heart disease, metabolic consequences, you know, diabetes, obesity, et cetera, et cetera. So, so waves and waves and droves and droves of people throughout the world with SARS-CoV-2 infection will contribute to, rise, to some rise in the burden of, of chronic disease, including cardiovascular disease, diabetes, kidney disease, et cetera, et cetera. And then really it's important for, to provide care for these people. These patients who really need care and post-acute strategies are, are really important. What makes long COVID really difficult though is that it's really also largely invisible. When, when we talk about pandemic, when we talk about you know, COVID-19, most of us, most of you, us, and, and the media, the politicians think about you know, the tip of the iceberg. They, they, Think about the toll of hospitalization, how many people you have in the hospital, how many cases of COVID-19, and how many deaths. We think about that. We think about cases, hospitalization, and death in the acute phase. And that's really the tip of the iceberg. Long COVID is really the invisible after effect. And this is what makes it hard to, to, to even wrap your head around it. It's, oh, these people had COVID like weeks ago. Like, what are you talking about long COVID now? It's really the invisible after effects. And, and it can result in disease and disability, can, can reduce, uh, also result in reduced life expectancy. We worry a lot about development educational attainment in kids, especially in kids who have brain fog and fatigue and PEM. They cannot do sports. They cannot really, you know, build and, 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 and sustain friendships. They suffer academically in school in terms of grades and all of that. This is really quite, quite really profoundly, you know, consequential for kids. Long COVID is likely to have economic implications. There are different estimates out there. One of them by David Cutler in the, um, at, at Harvard University estimating that the economic toll of long COVID in the U.S. alone is, is uh, about $3.7 trillion on par with the 
economic losses that we incurred in the 2008 recession. So it's a really big number. It's really actually hard. When I first read it, I had to talk. I actually had to call David and help me understand like what is he talking about with the, with this number because I couldn't really literally wrap my head around the 3.7 trillion dollar and understand what it really means. What does it mean to 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 have a a cost of 3.7 trillion dollar on the U.S. economy? We worry about the, about a lot about the impact on global health and sustainable development goals. So we we are a well resourced country. We can actually deal with things like this. I worry a lot about places in the world where they cannot deal with things like this. Also, I worry about the social and societal implications of, of long COVID. So um, these are the last few slides. I'm, I'm gonna sort of offer a little bit of reflections on challenges and opportunities that this pandemic posed to us. And, and I think the, the, one, of, one of the, you know, the major challenges in, 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 is that despite our best effort to, to really you know, advocate and, and, and make known the gravity of long COVID, we still feel that the care of people with long COVID is suboptimal in the United States, is really suboptimal. A lot of people are not able to access clinics. You know, clinic, uh, clinic wait time is long. A lot of times they're met with providers who are not trained to recognize long COVID, so they don't really know what to do. And, and this really, in, in our view, should be should be solved. Uh, we, we think that prevention strategies are underutilized, you know, very clearly in, in the vaccine data, you know, this year, you know, vaccine uptake is really, really dramatically low. There's not enough uh, people who are really thinking about improving ventilation, air filtration systems in their buildings, et cetera, et cetera. All of these are good prevention strategies that we think are, are underutilized. There is no treatment so far for, for long COVID. Um, there's no consensus on terms, definitions, and clinical endpoints. And I think this is also really a major hurdle that would need to be addressed over the next uh, you know, se several months. And I, and I do hope there is some pressure to uh, address this and build consensus. Uh, no systems to measure the burden of infection associated chronic illnesses. Like there are literally no systems in the US to, to do that. The CDC surveillance systems, they really stop at 30 days. Ask them, ask the CDC, what happened on day 31? Nobody knows. Because our, our data systems for infectious diseases at the CDC were built on the archaic notion that if you have an infectious disease or an emerging threat, emerging infectious disease, what, what you really need to care about case counts, hospitalization, and death in the first 30 days, in the acute phase. That's how you measure the, 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 really the gravity of the disease without really paying attention to what's happening, you know, and again, the, 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 what, what's sort of under the hood or, 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 or you know, this... A hidden part of the the, the 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 iceberg. So no systems to measure the burden of infection associated chronic illnesses. And and really we don't really know there's still big gap or in knowledge that we don't really know what what's gonna happen as a result of SARS-CoV-2 infection five years, 10 years, 15 years from now. Get get asked questions a lot by people who have brain fog. Will they develop dementia or early dementia just because they have brain brain fog? Will they be at higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease? You know, so all these questions are unresolved. Like, will will some people develop Parkinson's disease? You know, so we, we really don't know the the long term consequences of SARS CoV two infection or COVID nineteen, and we definitely would need to invest in surveillance systems to help us, you know, understand what you know the the the, the consequences at five years, ten years, fifteen years, so we can better understand the 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 the, the total effect of of of, of COVID nineteen on people's health. And really the politicization of public health in the US and actually in much of the world with a lot of misinformation, disinformation, anti-vaccine and anti-science movements. And that's really unfortunate, but it's also the reality in, in the US and, and, and in much of the world. But but there are there are a lot of opportunities. I, I think the scope and the scale of this pandemic is really truly an historic opportunity to once and for all understand why acute infections, why viruses, or acute infections cause chronic disease? I think that's a really very, very important question, very foundational question in, in our civilization. We need to understand. We're going to live with viruses for probably you know, thousands, if not, if not millions of years. And we need to understand, we really need to understand why acute viruses in some instances lead to chronic disease. You know, Because our kids, if, if not in our lifetime, our kids will face future pandemics. And they're going to be long covid 2040 or 2050 or 2060 or long virus 2050. And we would have failed them if we don't really solve this problem now. They're going to be looking back and say, they got hit with the pandemic in 2020. They actually had all the clues to decipher what long COVID is. 
and why COVID at the time gave people chronic illness, and they didn't do that. Now, as a result, we're now dealing with chronic illness in 2040 or 2050 or 2060. So it's really very, very important to really try to, try to understand that. I think one of the really beautiful things that, that the, or I think opportunity that really presented itself during this pandemic is really patient as partners. If I, I, I hope I highlighted to, to you at the very beginning of the talk, really the importance of the patient movement and actually directing us and telling us like, go here, look here. You know, we're suffering here. We're having brain fog. We're having fatigue. We're having what, what they call post-exertional malaise. And we're calling all of that long COVID and you need to think about it, Ziad, and your team. So really patients as, par as partners in this journey, helping orient us, teaching us about, you know, all the manifestations of long COVID, orienting our research agenda and helping us even make sense of it, understanding like the results and what they really, what they really mean. There is a lot of what we can do also in sort of opportunities. I listed the prevention here, you know, we could, we could definitely invest in improving ventilation and filtration systems, you know, better vaccines, the vaccine that actually induces strong mucosal immunity and expand the pipeline of antivirals. You know, if you really think about it, we're now reliant on literally for the most part Paxlovid. For those of you who think about antimicrobial resistance or antiviral resistance, you know, <laughs> it, it's, it's really scary. It's really scary that we're reliant on literally like one or maybe like every year or monoparavir, two antivirals. Should the virus continue to evolve and develop resistance, uh, you know, for these two antivirals, we'll be, we'll be left with zero antivirals, zero medication to actually treat acute COVID-19. So I, I think this is really important to try to expand the pipeline of antivirals. There is really a lot of effort that needs to be happening in the area of treatment. Again, zero, zero medications for, for COVID-19. And if we learn one thing from this pandemic, we need to learn that pandemic have long-term effects and we need to invest in data systems, surveillance and epidemiology system for post-acute illness. This is very, very important. And also how do we optimize our systems to generate what I call real-time, real-world evidence generation. So evidence that responds to real-world question questions in near real-time. Those are very, very, very important opportunities. So in summary, I, I hope I was able to convey at least in part that, that patience inspired us, really, really inspired every part of this journey from the beginning to, 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 this, to this moment, inspired the questions, you know, helped sort of sustain. Somebody asked me like, how do you keep the energy going? Like what sustains you? And really the true answer here is really the, the feedback from patients. When, we, when I hear from patients that, oh, your work validated my experience. It resonated with me. It made me feel heard. It made me feel seen. You know, it, it, I, I see, I see, you know, that, 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 you know, other people are also having similar problem when I read your research. So it's really wonderful to sort of hear the feedback from patients. I also shared with you that long COVID is a multifaceted disease, non-monolithic disease that can affect nearly every organ system. It is very, very important to think about post-acute you know, COVID care strategies. We made progress on prevention. We know how to prevent long COVID, but really we need trials for treatment. This is, I cannot emphasize this enough. We need trials for treatment, uh, you know. So I, I, I said something last week saying that we've done trials for vaccines at record speed, at warp speed, right? We're doing trials for long COVID at snail speed. This is what we're doing. And this must change. It really, really must change. I think this pandemic sort of illustrated an intimate link between infections and chronic illnesses. And I offer some reflections on, on lessons learned. I really, I cannot do what I do without really the, the amazing support from a lot of people. Some of them here, sort of the, the biostatistics team, including Yan Shea, uh, the amazing Taeyang Cho, Evan, uh, Charlie, uh, Benjamin Bo, Miao Kai. Um, people who participated in this, but did not directly in the work, I presented the Daniel Eaton, Andrew Gibson, John Secante. We enjoy funding from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs and some from the American Society of Nephrology. Susan Wood is, the, is really the most amazing person. She literally runs my office, and and without without the support and help from Susan Wood, actually none of this would have been would have been possible. And really, the very vigorous support from the Veterans Research and Education Foundation, led by the amazing Ali Schaefer. Allison is is also another wonderful person who, without her, we we could not do this. As I, as I may, may have said before, and also in talking to some of you individually, we place a lot of emphasis on communicating the science uh, and the Public Affairs Office at Washington University plays a central role in helping us disseminate the science to the wider public, including Christina, who's done 
most of the press releases that we issued you know, throughout the pandemic, and Diane Williams, who's absolutely amazing. So thank you very much again for the really the opportunity to give this this talk, and would love a, would love to have a Q and A. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ali. Uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions. I just want to say we have a bunch of questions online and some in the room. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to alternate one live and one one not live, or as it may be. Okay, we'll take a first question with somebody in the room. Yes, go ahead. Stand up, please. And I think we have microphones going around. No, back, back there, uh, Brad, thanks. So people online can hear your question as well. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. I was wondering when you were going through and making your massive control group, did you consider asymptomatic carriers and control for that? And kind of similarly with asymptomatic carriers, if you're not demonstrating symptoms of infection, do you tend to have any long COVID impacts from the virus? Thank I you. love that. This is really brilliant. So because, because they're asymptomatic and carrier, and if they're undiagnosed, if they were not diagnosed, they would end up in the control group. And, and this is really important because uh, you, you should be asking now, like, how does this bias the results? Or like, how would this really bias the results? If, if anything, you know, it, it's either neutral, neutral, meaning like there's no effect if, if these asymptomatic carriers have, don't develop long COVID at all, which we now know is wrong. But let's say at the time, if they don't develop long COVID at all, they would have a neutral effect. There would be no bias. And if they develop long COVID and ended up in the control group, they will actually narrow the difference between the two groups, basically underestimating the, the, the burden of long COVID, right? So those are the, the, the two things that could happen. Now, since then, we now know from work that was done really beautifully in, in the UK that asymptomatic people can also still develop long COVID, but at a very, very, very low rate. Again, remember like the Prevalence of long COVID seems to correlate with the severity of infection. People who have very severe disease have highest prevalence. People who have mild disease have lowest prevalence. People who have asymptomatic infection have almost like detectable, but but very, very low prevalence. Detectable, but it's not it's not zero. So it can still end up with long COVID, very, very, very low prevalence. Okay, let me take a, an online question. Uh, this question is should long COVID patients receive any additional COVID-19 vaccinations? Mm -hmm. So uh, the recommendation is that for for people with uh, with uh, with long COVID is to to get vaccinated or follow the recommendation of vaccination like for like anyone else. So there's nothing really no additional. I think the question is that additional. When they, uh, no, just get the booster for this year, and and, and that's no additional vaccination for COVID nineteen. Carla, you got the microphone. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, nice talk. I, I have a quick question, and it seems to me that everything boils down and to, to have a molecular marker to follow long COVID, which is something that we haven't mentioned at all, because I can picture 10 years from now, a person goes and has a cardiovascular problem, and, and the clinician will treat it as a regular cardiovascular disease instead of a consequence of long COVID. So... Um, could you could you uh, elaborate on, yes. on potential molecular markers that I, are being? I, I love the way you think. This this is exactly on point. This is exactly on point. So so um, at this point, there's no biomarker, but I think this is what we need to drive the field. I mean, again, this is an embryonic field. This is this whole thing is less than four years old. Okay, we. <laughs> We didn't know about long COVID in 2019 and early 2020. Actually, so this is all less than four years old, or four years old. So, but, but this is what we need to drive the, the field toward development of biomarkers to help us sort of distinguish, you know, what, long, what is sort of the, what are the sequelae that are actually plausibly attributable to SARS-CoV-2 infection and then, and then, you know, everything else, right? So, and, and, and I think that that field is in its infancy and, and we need to continue to drive it forward. And, and, and the, I want to mention something. And the reason it's important, not only just sort of like, oh, your, your heart attack is due to your COVID, because actually it may have a different prognosis and also may respond differently to treatment because the biology is different, right? So it may look like a heart attack. It may look like, oh, well, Mr. Smith had a heart attack. He had a chest pain and high troponin, but it's driven biologically by a sort of different scenario, right? So it may respond differently to treatment. So it's not only for intellectual curiosity, we want to develop a biomarker for Mr. Smith, we want to develop because actually it it literally may respond differently to to may have the prognosis and, and and different treatment approaches. So they're very very important, but we're still very early in sort of thinking and 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 developing those things. Asking, can you speak on the potential long term impacts of COVID infection among young children specifically, many of whom were first infected 
prior to becoming eligible for the vaccines and to continue that very low vaccine uptake while experiencing reinfection. Yeah, I, I really worry about, as I said, I worry a lot about children and, and the effect of uh, long COVID on children. Luckily, luckily, the, the prevalence of long COVID in children is very low. Is low is much lower than adults, so it's good. It's much lower than adults, but still happening. And and uh, and and we know long COVID manifests with brain fog, with neurocognitive decline, neurocognitive changes, fatigue, post-exertional malaise. Those are all the things that kids don't want to have when they're growing up and trying to play sports and trying to make friends and trying to you know get good good grades and 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 get to college, right? So I I worry a lot about that and and uh, and and this is why we we definitely need to continue to to better our understanding of the biology of this. Most importantly, treat it to be able to offer treatment to these kids because currently there's literally like a kid comes to clinic, there's a pediatric clinic I watch you with long COVID and there is no. There, there is, there's, they have brain fog. There's really no treatment. There's just no treatment. Uh, Anthony, you got the mic. Go ahead. So I'm wondering <clears throat> about the status of the immune system overlaying all of this, because one way of looking at this is there are some other diseases that actually they start as viral diseases, but then they tend, then they grow into generalized inflammatory disorders. And so, do you think that's possible? Um, have you or any other, I'm imagining other groups must have looked at this in the long COVID subset of looking at Im immune markers and beginning to follow yes. that over time. Yes. So, so there are, there are, uh, you know, clearly um, a, you know, a sort of a, almost like a distinct immune fingerprints of long COVID. And Aikiko Iwasaki did some work that she had a really wonderful paper in nature about, um, you know, six months ago, mm -hmm. sort of doing immune, quote unquote, immune profiling of people with long COVID. So the very distinct, you know, uh, you know, sort of immune fingerprints with sort of, a, you know, changes in, you know, sort of the, the uh, monocyte numbers, you know, some cytokines numbers. So there's really quite a bit of sort of different changes that, that happens in people with long COVID that, that, that uh, suggest that the immune system is certainly involved. But 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 I think that our understanding of that is still is still in infancy. And a follow up: Is there any sense that there's a, a long term reservoir of vi virus dwelling in one or more organs that hasn't been detected? Yes. Yeah, so so uh, we know from autopsy studies that have been done in people who had SARS-CoV-2 infection and then died you know died from something else, like somebody had SARS-CoV-2 infection and subsequently let's say died from a car accident, right? So NIH did this, and then Dan Chernow, uh, Chertow had a really nice paper also in Nature, uh, about four, 44 autopsies, four and four, four, 44 autopsies, and demonstrating the presence of the virus in extra pulmonary sites months after the initial infection, in some cases seven months after the initial infection in places like the brain, so the virus was in the brain, in other parts of the central nervous system, in the heart, in the coronary artery, and in, in the GI tract, and in an extra pulmonary site outside outside the lung. Again, remember this is a SARS-CoV-2. It's R. It's a respiratory virus. But Dan and his team showed this really brilliant paper in, in, in Nature about a year ago, in 44 autopsies, very well documented work that the virus was present in in the so in in the in extra pulmonary sites. Now, whether those viruses that were actually replicating or capable of replication, you know, and how far out after the acute infection where they're still replicating and then inducing, you know, inflammation and, and damage, that, that still is evolving. Like we don't know, but but really, you know, so, so then, and they're doing that work, but we don't know the results yet. So we, we don't know the results of, the, of, of those studies yet, but, but there's, there, there's a lot of work being done exactly to sort of help us vet and evaluate the viral persistence hypothesis and determine whether th this is really actually explains some of the manifestations that we see in long COVID. Well, uh, take one more question online. Sorry, to stay on time. Um, <clears throat> are there any studies including <clears throat> individuals that have problems with drug dependence? Are they at increased risk for long COVID since they're already compromised? Well, I, I don't. I don't know specifically about sort of the people who have dr drug dependence, but but we know generally speaking that that um, you know. Uh, uh, long COVID is non monolithic, so so uh, it, it can, but it can affect people across the lifespan, and 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 can affect you know kids, can affect older adults. You know, we we tend to see, generally speaking, generally speaking, that people who had poorer baseline health to start with, from whatever reason, like diabetes, heart disease, lung disease, all of that, they actually tend to have a, the highest risk later on of of developing these complications. Uh, so this is sort of a generally like poor, poor baseline health, including the presence of a lot of comorbidities initially is associated with higher risk of long-term problems. 
Then I'm going to take the privilege of asking you one question. Mike, uh, yes. we talked earlier today about uh, our testing lab that Carla Finkelstein runs and, and early observations that the titers of the viral load did not seem to be necessarily directly related, as a matter of fact, not related to the clinical course of the disease or the severity. If you were to plot a matrix in three dimensions of the viral load, the severity of cl clinical symptoms, and long COVID likelihood, is there, do you predict or do you know if there is a relationship back to that? I think the only thing that we really, really know is that the severity of the disease correlates with the with long COVID. But I think you and I we talked and sort of this is a, I think there's sort of a, a still uncertainty whether the actually the severity correlates with the initial viral load in, in, in many people. And, and I mean, and, uh, some people believe that, that that's the case. You know, there's clearly some scholars or some people Sort of believe that that's the case. I, I, I'm not convinced empirically that, that we actually know this for a fact. Sure. Please join me. Thanks, Dr. Alan.